Section 5 of the Catholic's Ready Answer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill. The Bible and Modern Thought. Objection. The Bible is for many reasons deserving of veneration, but it is quite out of harmony with modern thought. The science, the aspirations, and the general point of view of the modern world are at the opposite pole from the contents of the Bible. The answer. Language like this is held by persons in our day who fancy that all men of enlightenment have ranged themselves with science on one side against the Bible and its adherents on the other. Is it not the unique distinction of the Bible that it has compelled the attention of the enlightened since the beginning of Christianity? From the first great convert of St. Paul's at Athens to that group of brilliant minds ending with St. Augustine, which adored the early centuries of the Church, and thence onward to the great lights of the modern world, we find the great minds of the world's history humbly accepting the Bible as the revealed word of God, and as their guide, conjointly with the Church, to eternal life. From the way our critics talk, one would think that at least all men of science had discarded the Bible, and yet when the facts are inquired into, it is found that the great leaders of science— the men without whom science would be whole centuries behind its present stage of development, have been sincere Christians and believers in the Bible, when we find a Bacon, a Copernicus, a Newton, a Leibniz, or, to come down to our own generation, a Calvin, a Pasteur, clinging to the Bible, though standing themselves on the very pinnacle of science, we have good reason for thinking that science and the Bible are not such irreconcilable foes after all. See Science and Faith, page 413. The ranks of unbelievers have indeed swollen in our day, but the radical cause of this phenomenon does not lie in any shortcomings of the Bible. The cause is usually of a personal nature. It is natural that some should have a personal interest in wishing that the Bible were not authentic. For if the contents of the Bible are true, a personal service of God and a restraint of the passions are imperative. Thus the wish is father to the thought. And the habit of mind thus engendered is fostered by a neglect of the duties of religion. Faith is a grace, and a grace is forfeited by a failure to correspond to it. A personal shrinking from the scorn of unbelievers, and no class is more intolerant than they, accounts for the multitude of a large number who talk about modern thought, or who have other such sibyleths constantly on their lips. This being the case, we are compelled to discount considerably the face value of the testimony which is supposed to be rendered against the Bible by big numbers. After doing so, we shall probably find a comparatively small number of persons who, from one cause or another, a lack of Christian training, it may be, or the fact that they have never seen a complete exposition of Christian evidences, profess, if not opposition to the Bible, at least an inability to accept it as the depository of divine revelation. Now, it is more than likely that some who belong to this class have really never read the Bible, or that they have read only parts of it here and there, or that they have read it under the guidance of one of those microscopic experts of the higher criticism, who are skilled in examining single words and phrases, but who are unable to see the wood from the trees. To any sincere mind thus circumstanced, we must beg leave to make the following suggestions. Read the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, from beginning to end. You will notice that you are reading not one book but many books, a whole literature, in fact, whose one subject is God and his dealings with the human race. Begun several thousand years ago, it has received additions at intervals, according as God has deigned to reveal himself to his chosen people. Now, notwithstanding the multiplicity of its parts and the length of the time it took to compose them, you will discover, on the one hand, a remarkable unity, and on the other, a remarkable growth of ideas. You will see the light of truth increasing from the dawn to the perfect day. You will see evidence of prophecy fulfilled. Finally, you will see salvation brought to the Gentiles, and the light of truth diffused throughout the world by the coming of him who is the way, the truth, and the life. One of the fruits, it may be hoped, of so comprehensive a view of the subject will be an answer supplied to a very important question, to wit, how account for its sublime conception of the deity, and for the purity and holiness of its public worship amidst the idolatries and impurities of all the surrounding nations? How for its monuments, its customs, its laws? How shall we account for the very preservation of a race of so unique a character, and one that never rose to empire for well nigh two thousand years amidst circumstances constantly tending to its destruction? Given the Jewish race, we look for its complement in a literature that shall interpret it as a fact in the world's history. And if such a literature be forthcoming, who will be surprised to find it abounding in the marvelous? And yet a mere reading of the Bible will not suffice. The Bible cannot be read in any and every frame of mind. To read it in a fault-finding temper would be fatal to an understanding of its meaning and spirit. Yet we are not counseling that it be read with a wish to believe, or a strained effort to get into sympathy with its contents. We might in that case seem to be advising a species of auto-suggestion, against which our very knowing generation is so much on its guard. All that we ask is that you bring to the reading of the Bible as much open-mindedness as you would bring to the reading of any other body of literature, sacred or profane. 
We ask you not to believe, but to regard as conceivable, not only that there is an infinite and eternal God, or that he is able to reveal his mind and will to those whom he has created, but also that he might on occasions manifest his presence and his power by extraordinary events. The evidence that there is such a God, and that he has so manifested himself to mankind, will develop itself in your mind as you proceed through the volume. We feel confident that no skeptic can read the sacred writings from beginning to end in the unbiased temper we have been describing without feeling his whole attitude of mind undergoing a change. This will especially be the case when he arrives at the narrative of the Savior's life as given in the Gospels, a life which, when viewed in both its own wonderful details and in its relation to types and prophecies, indeed to the whole of Jewish history, proves that there has been a veritable opening of the heavens and that God has, in a most remarkable and touching way, revealed himself to mankind in the earthly career of his eternal and only begotten Son. But perhaps you are under the spell of the scientific hubbub, which has tended of late years to trouble some Christian minds. You have perhaps heard the note of triumph sounded by anti-Christian scientists, and sounded still louder by many of their unscientific followers. But a slight review of the results of scientific research will probably convince you that in this scientific jubilation there has been much noise but little wool. The experimental sciences, to begin with, have been invoked against the supernatural element in holy writ, especially against miraculous interference with what are called nature's laws. Miracles are impossible, we are told, because they are an interference with the constancy and uniformity of natural laws. Now, in the first place, it must be remembered that we stand in no need of modern science to be informed that nature behaves in certain uniform ways, e.g. that fire burns and that water quenches fire. Common observation has told us much since the days of Adam. Science has but extended and methodized common observation. Nature's uniformity is no more certain today than it was thousands of years ago. But apart from that matter, neither science nor common observation can go a step further than to declare that it is of the nature of water, or of fire, or of any other natural agent to behave in a certain way, and that they have, as a matter of fact, so behaved. But to declare that under no circumstances can they behave otherwise is quite beyond their province. There is no warrant in science, therefore, for saying there can be no interference with nature's laws. Ordinary experience proves that such interference is possible. A stone, in obedience to the law of gravitation, falls earthward, but its fall may be arrested by a human hand. Why cannot God, the author of nature, arrest its fall as well? Science would not be disproved by interference in either case. Science can only tell us what things do in accordance with their natures, not what they will do as a matter of fact. The miracles of the Bible are therefore not proved impossible by science. Ah, but there is evolution in my way, you will remind me. How can I ever get beyond that? Why is evolution such an obstacle in your way? If you could once step out of your anti-Christian environment, evolution would appear in a somewhat new light. You would find that among sincere Christians, even among Catholics, there are those who are convinced that within certain limits there has been an evolution of species among animals and plants. Opinions favoring a limited evolution of species may be traced back as far as certain of the fathers, the great Christian authorities of the early centuries, notably St. Augustine of the 5th century. You probably mean by evolution just one type of evolutionary theory, the pure Darwinian, which held sway for a few decades, but which, as professional scientists well know, has since been shoved more than halfway off its throne. Indeed, the fortunes of pure Darwinism furnish a striking illustration of what the cooler heads among Catholic theologians have been predicting for many a day. Let scientific theorizing run its course, they have told us, and if it be opposed to Christian truth, it will eventually show a suicidal tendency. Among leading evolutionists, natural selection is no longer in the ascendant. It was always a thorn in Darwin's side that certain devout Darwinians would not follow their leader the whole length of the theory on natural selection. Even the joint author and propounder with Darwin of the theory of natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace, steadily held to the spiritual nature and divine origin of the human soul, and after more than a half-century study of the subject, he published a work, The World of Life, in which more emphatically than ever he averred that phenomena which he described and of which he had made a very special study proved the existence of a creative power, a directive mind, an ultimate purpose, which is no other than the development of man, a being who is intended to interpret the rest of nature and deduce from its phenomena the existence of a supreme and overruling mind as their necessary cause. Here is evolution, after its long excursion in the wilds, meeting Christianity at the crossroads and hailing it as a friend. There seems to be nothing inconsistent with Christian teaching and holding that the present countless species of animals and plants have evolved from a smaller number of primitive species. And even though any such evolution of species would have required immensely long periods of time to elapse before the appearance of man on the earth, there can be little or no difficulty in granting their existence. For although the whole material universe was made in six days, as the Bible narrates, there is no certain indication in the Bible of the length of each of the six days. For all we know to the contrary, it may have been an exceedingly long period. 
In pursuance of the evolutionary idea as applied to man, the most strenuous endeavors have been made to discover the missing link, that is to say, any fossil remains of an extinct species intermediate between man and the ape. As such connecting species would, in Darwin's view, be exceedingly numerous, it is a wonder that we have not been stumbling against them in every morning's walk in the country. As it is, an occasional reputed discovery has created a sensation for a brief period, but eventually has been shelved, once and for all, as a scientific myth. As to the more extreme types of evolutionary theory, the Hegelian, for instance, which is an extension of Darwin's ideas to the whole range of being, we shall have to refer you to the articles entitled specifically Evolution and Haeckel, remarking, however, that you will search in vain in the books of Haeckel and his compeers for anything that even pretends to be a demonstration of any single proposition that is distinctive of their system. As regards the objections so frequently urged in the name of astronomical science, we shall have a word to say about them in the article entitled Bible and Science. No less futile are the objections based on historical and archaeological science and on the higher criticism. The attacks made upon Christianity from this quarter are probably more persistent and relentless than any others. And yet, what has been accomplished by our assailants? What fact or what principle has been evolved which contradicts any essential or quasi-essential Christian idea? For not every idea that has gained currency among Christians can be regarded as an essential part of Christian doctrine. Propositions that have been defined by competent authority, and those all but certain or morally certain facts or truths which have been generally held as such by Christians, as, for instance, the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, these are matters about which we should feel concerned, even if prima facie evidence against them, or anything resembling it, were supplied by honest criticism, but such is not the case. The false anti-Christian hypotheses so freely adopted by the higher critics have actually retarded the progress of true criticism. Here, as everywhere else, hunting on the wrong trail has been a sheer loss of time. It is refreshing to hear a leading specialist in matters archaeological, such as Professor Sace of Oxford, taking to task the more extravagant of the higher critics. The arrogancy of tone, he remarks, adopted at times by the higher criticism, has been productive of nothing but mischief. It has aroused distrust even of its most certain results, it has betrayed the critic into a dogmatism as unwarrantable as it is unscientific. Baseless assumptions have been placed on a level with ascertained facts, hasty conclusions have been put forward as principles of science, and we have been called upon to accept the prepossessions and fancies of the individual critic as the revelation of a new gospel. The Higher Criticism and the Verdict of the Monuments, page 5. Not infrequently, while the higher critic is weaving his fabric of mixed fact and hypothesis, the spade of the explorer among the ruins of some ancient city turns up an object bearing an inscription which obliges the critic to undo his work to the last thread. Speaking of the effect of archaeological discovery on the conclusions of the higher criticism, the author quoted above remarks, The assumptions and preconceptions with which the higher criticism started, and upon which so many of its conclusions are built, have been swept away either wholly or in part, and in place of the skepticism it engendered, there is now a danger lest the oriental archaeologist should adopt too excessive a credulity. The revelations of the past which have been made to him of late years have inclined him to believe that there is nothing impossible in history any more than there is in science, and that he is called upon to believe rather than doubt. So that there are two sides to the picture, one of which you had hardly supposed to be in existence. We have been dealing almost exclusively with modern science because it is chiefly science, or what is taken for science, that is flaunted so contemptuously in the face of religion. As to the aspirations of the modern world, these are likely to prove its bane. The inflated human spirit aspires to being the self-sufficing lord of the earth and the supreme arbiter of human destiny, with no need of God or of heaven, or of grace or of salvation. But this is not the first time that the aspirations of created beings have soared too high. I will ascend above the height of the clouds, I will be like the Most High, was the aspiration of Lucifer. We shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, was the aspiration of our first parents. And who can doubt that the same nemesis will overtake the third and last class of aspirants, as overtook the first and the second? The proud aspirations of the human spirit will ever have been the worst obstacle both to the happiness and to the truest progress of the race. And why so? Because, and here we shall be using language familiar to modern thought, such aspirations are supremely unscientific. How so? Simply by not recognizing that the true basis of all rational aspiration lies in a fact, and that fact is that we are created beings, and consequently must submit to be taught and ruled by the Creator. No wonder that your general point of view is not the same as that of the writers of the Holy Writ. End of section 5. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio.